God is good. I'm going to direct your attention to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 32. We're going to be reading a couple of verses there, some very familiar verses. I'm reading from the uh, New International Version. Genesis chapter 32, uh, reading verses 24 to 28. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And so in this moment, I just like to say a word of prayer that the will of God and the voice of God will speak into this place and wherever you are consuming this message that the voice of God will be present. Amen. God, we stand here in this holy moment. We're looking to hear from you. We're looking to be transformed by your presence, by your spirit. And so I pray right now that you will open our ears to hear what the spirit says to the church. Manifest your presence, oh God, so that we can hear your word. We can receive your word. We can go out and do your word. We can be transformed by your word. I pray, God, that miracles, signs, and wonders will be manifested in this place, God. I pray anybody who came in to this place with a need on their heart, Lord, that it would be met here today. I pray that the hearts of your people would be open, Lord, both online and in this building, that we will, Lord, come in faith and we'll open ourselves up to you, Lord God. As the song was saying, we would come to the altar and in faith call out to you in worship and in expectation. God, do what only you can do. I pray and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, just smile at someone, greet, at some, greet someone, give someone a high five, a fist bump. Just greet someone in the name of the Lord. You who are online, if you have people with you, you may be in your living room, just high five someone and uh, smile at them and just enjoy the presence of the Lord. Amen. Uh, for the next few moments, I'd just like to speak from this thought. Never giving up on my faith in God. Never giving up on my faith in God. And so as we look to discuss this topic, it's important that we recognize that our faith in God is the foundation of our relationship with God. And so you'll likely hear me say this more than once. This will be a refrain that you will likely hear coming from me from time to time, but it's important that we establish this principle that our relationship with God is based upon Faith. It's important that we all understand that principle and we lay that foundation very strongly. And so the Bible is very clear and very articulate about this point as well. The importance of faith as the basis of our interaction with God. And so faith can be defined as complete trust in someone or something. In this case, we're not just talking about general faith. I mean, we apply general faith in our life. But I'm not interested in the application of general faith this morning. I'm speaking about faith in Jesus Christ. And so as we define faith, it's complete trust and complete dependence in Jesus Christ. And so as we consider faith, we're told in Hebrews chapter 1. Now, faith is confidence 
in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so what this is trying to communicate to us is that our faith gives us confidence that we will receive what we are believing God for. And that same faith serves as evidence that we will receive something from God while we're waiting for an answer. So faith is that expectation that whatever we're praying for we'll receive or we'll receive a response from God. And so faith is the expectation of our hope. But faith is also the evidence that what we are expecting or what we are hoping for will actually happen. We are told very clearly in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, that the salvation that we have is by faith. It's not by anything that we do. It's not by works. It's by faith. The very foundation of our salvation is laid upon the foundation of faith in Jesus. And so the virtue of faith is at the core of humanity's interaction with the living God. And so as you begin to survey the Gospels, and you see how Jesus interacted with his community. He interacted with his disciples. He interacted with people who came to him in need, regardless of what that need was. Whether someone needed eyesight, their vision restored, whether they needed their ears to be opened, whether they needed healing for themselves or for a family member or for a friend whether they needed to be delivered from leprosy. And Jesus would respond, and Jesus would heal. But there's this refrain that plays over in the Gospels. Jesus would say something to the effect, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And so coming to Jesus is important. Engaging with the Word of God is important. However, if we do not bring our faith to the encounter, then our engagement will not be to its fullest potential. And so when I come to God, I have to have faith in Him. And the beauty is, you don't have to have a lot of faith. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. And so we have some friends in Ottawa, and they, last year, they, they I think their church organized a, a trip to Israel. And uh, my wife asked um, uh, her friend to bring her back some some olive oil from Israel and some mustard seeds. And if you see these mustard seeds, I mean, it's the, it's the smallest, it's the smallest of things. I mean, it's really, it's small. It's really, really small. But Jesus said, if you have that kind of faith, itty bittiest of faith you can say to this mountain be thou removed into the sea and it will happen why because of my faith absolutely not a mustard seed you flick it and you God help you to try to find that anywhere you dropped it that's not the point. The, the dynamic is just express 
just a little bit of confidence in God. And so if you will put just a little bit of faith in God, then what you see as impossible becomes possible. Not because you have this great skill set, not because you have this talent, not because you have all these relationships, but because you are willing to put just a little bit of faith in God. And so Jesus said in in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, Therefore I tell you, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it, and it will be yours. In fact, Hebrews 6 tells us, without faith, without faith, it is M possible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is. It's, 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 like, it's like the Lord engaging with, with Moses by the bush. And, and God calls to Moses from this burning bush, and he starts to talk to him, and he tells him, you know, you're going to go down to Egypt, and you're going to give these messages to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him to let my people go. And Moses, as anyone in their thinking mind, raised the question, as probably you and I would, and he says, who should I say is sending me? Who should I say this message is coming from? And the Lord just told him to tell Moses, you just tell them that I am who I am. And so if we do not have faith in God that he is who he is, it is impossible for us to please him. In fact, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find faith? And so it's important for us to lay the foundation and establish the principle that we interact with God on the basis of faith. And so thinking about this idea of never giving up on my faith in God. We can look at Jacob and his experience as an example of what this may look like in someone's life. And so we understand from Genesis chapter 32, I encourage you to read it, that Jacob had some phenomenal experiences with God and he was incredibly blessed. And if you read this particular passage of scripture from the King James Version, the Bible tells us that his name was changed to reflect the fact that as a prince, he had power with God and he prevailed. Now, what I'm wanting us to see is ourselves in the story. And so I'm just not coming up here to give you some beautiful narration. I want you to put yourself in the story. I want you to realize that with God there is no respecter of persons. The idea that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if he would interact with Jacob in this way, then he would interact with you and I in this way. And so we read about Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. But it's important for us to recognize that Jacob was not perfect. So we're putting ourselves in this story. That means for us to have experiences with God, we don't need to be perfect. And I'm... I'm probably going to undo 
um, some work of some, some diligent husbands online and in the building. Uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, you do the repair when you get home. But I know that men work to make their women feel like they're perfect. And you put the work in and God bless you for doing that. Uh, I'm trying myself, but I'm not perfect. So it's a work in progress. Th this is where you guys are supposed to laugh. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. So let's liberate ourselves right now from that burden and that weight of trying to be perfect. We're in here, we're engaged online, we're engaged with a relationship with God. We may as well allow God to use us to the fullest capacity that he desires in our lives. And so be liberated from the idea of being perfect. You're not perfect. That is why God called you. If you were perfect, he wouldn't have called you. But he called you not for your perfection, but he called you because he wants to perfect you. He wants your glo his glory to be seen in you. I, I, you, 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 you heard me when I came. I, I said, you know, it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. And I, I, I love coming to the house of God. It's exciting for me. But this is not all God has called me to. God didn't just call me to come into the house of God Sunday after Sunday and to receive the amazing worship and word of God. No, God called me because he wanted to fill me with his spirit and he wanted to use me mightily. God didn't just call you to come and sit in this beautiful building. God didn't just call you to log in to Faith Sanctuary app or Faith Sanctuary YouTube or however you're connecting to us. God called you because his purpose and his desire and his will for your life, he wants to be fulfilled. And it doesn't require perfection, but it requires us to continue to have faith in God. And so Jacob wasn't perfect. In fact, if you look up the name Jacob, it means supplanter, deceiver, crook and thief. That's the Chris Simpson commentary. You're not going to find that in <laughs> any established Bible dictionary or commentary. But Do was a little deceptive. And so many of us know the story. He deceived his father into giving him the birthright. He had an accomplice, but we're not focusing on his accomplice. We're focusing on him. The fact that he had a desire for good things, but his methods were deceitful, dishonest. And so he deceived his father into giving him the blessing of the firstborn. And so in this ancient Near East culture, the firstborn received this the promises that were bestowed upon that family and the bulk of the inheritance was to go to the firstborn. But Jacob wasn't the firstborn. He was a twin, but he came out second. But he deceived his father into placing the blessing of the firstborn on his life. And so he was deceitful. He was dishonest. And so we have to be careful about our ambitions. It's good to have ambition. It's good to have a desire. It's good to have a drive. It's good to desire to achieve and accomplish. But if we're not careful, our ambition can cause us to disobey the Word of God. And so another example of some folks that had ambition but allowed their ambition to disobey or prompt them to disobey the word of God. And so think about Adam and Eve in the garden. And so God tells them, I want you to be blessed, to be fruitful and multiply. 
and just conquer. I'm placing you in this perfect garden and it will take care of itself. You just tend to it. Of every tree in this garden, you can eat except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the Bible tells us, after having a conversation with the, the serpent, the deceiver, the Bible says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, ambition. I want to level up my wisdom. I want to have this appealing thing. The Bible says she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and she ate it. And so Jacob suffered the consequences of his choices being imperfect. Adam and Eve suffered the consequences of their choices being imperfect. But the thing is about Jacob, he never gave up on his faith in God. His brother was angry and his brother committed to killing him. That's a bad situation. But it was a consequence of Jacob's deception. But in all of that, Jacob never gave up on his faith in God. And so he continued to believe God for blessings in his life. He continued to believe God for guidance in his life. He continued to believe God for protection over his life. And so the lesson to us should be that even though we may make some bad choices and we may need to repent and ask God to forgive us and to change our ways or correct some of the fallout of our bad choices, we may need to go and apologize as part of change and repentance. And so even though we may make bad choices and disobey the word of God, Jacob's example is telling us that we can still experience intimacy and closeness and relationship and the purpose of God in our lives. And so we should never give up on our faith in God. And so here's Jacob, his brother has committed to killing him. The only thing that his brother said is, I'm going to wait till my father dies. Once my father dies, this brother of mine is dead. And so his mother got wind of what was happening and she sent Jacob away to live with her brother. And so Jacob went away to live with his uncle. How many know whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Sometimes what you plant is what you're going to grow. We need to be mindful of that. If we plant hatred and unforgiveness and negativity and selfishness, then the likelihood is that's what we're going to harvest. That's what's going to come back to us. And so if we want grace, we have to give grace if we want forgiveness, we have to give forgiveness. If we want blessings, we have to allow God to use us to be a blessing to somebody else. The reason why I'm telling you this is because Jacob went to his uncle's house. But I think his uncle had the same kind of ambition that, that Jacob had. And so Jacob saw one of Laban's daughters, and he fell in love with her. Her name was Rachel. And Jacob said, look, you know what? I'll work seven years. And after seven years, I'd like your daughter's hand in marriage. And so Laban agreed. And after the seven years, when it came time for Jacob to receive Rachel's hand in marriage, just like Jacob was the younger of siblings, 
Rachel happened to be the younger of two sisters. She had an older sister. And so what Jacob's uncle did was he pulled a switcheroo. Not cool. Not that kind of switcheroo. Like, switch me red velvet for cheesecake. I'm cool with that kind of switcheroo. Switch my Odyssey for an X5. I'm really cool with that kind of switcheroo. But in this case, Jacob's uncle switched Rachel for the older sister Leah. He was deceived. And he was hot about it. And so his uncle said, we don't do that kind of thing. We marry off the first daughter before the second daughter. But look at that. Jacob himself now, he was on the other side of the deception. He was taken advantage. He was used. He was manipulated. He was the one who was hurt by the deception. But he still never gave up on his faith. We've got to maintain our faith in Jesus. Certainly online and in the building, there are those in here who have been taken advantage of by somebody else, someone you possibly thought was close to you, someone you thought was supposed to be looking out for you, someone you thought was supposed to be a protector for you, someone that you trusted, someone that you confided in, and they hurt you, they disappointed you, they betrayed your trust. It's an unfortunate reality that good people are susceptible to being preyed upon, especially in this dark culture of selfishness and predatory behavior. And so the thing here is that I'm sorry if someone took advantage of you. I'm sorry if someone hurt you. I'm sorry if someone disadvantaged you. I apologize, but don't give up on your faith in God. If Jacob had ended his faith in God in that moment, if he had said, this man Laban, my uncle, is a deceiver. He's a liar. And I wanted Leah and he gave me Rachel and I'm over with God. God, you're supposed to take care of me. You're supposed to protect me. I'm over with God. The purpose of God would likely have been fulfilled. Oh, you thought I was going to say the will of God wasn't going to happen? What we need to understand is that God is sovereign. God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the King of the universe. And whether I want to participate in God with God's plan or not, the sun is still going to shine. What am I saying? The glory of God is still going to be seen in the earth. Oh, you... Let me remind you of a story. Jesus uh, came into Jerusalem uh, during the Passion Week, uh, and there were people that were losing uh, their minds. Uh, they were worshiping. They had palms, and they laid it down, uh, and they were just blessing God. And the Pharisees looked around, and they were confused. They didn't understand it. And so they said, uh, you better stop these people from praising you. And Jesus looked at them and said, listen, if these should hold their peace, these rocks are going to cry out. What am I saying? God is going to get his glory. The will of God is going to happen. It's just do I want to get with it or not? Never give up on your faith in God.
And so Jacob, he never gave up on his faith. And so Jacob decided it was time for him to go home. And so he packed up his family. God blessed him tremendously by this point in his life. He had animals, wives, children, stuff. And he decided it was time to go home. Genesis chapter 32, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau. He had sent a message to Esau. Just letting Esau know, I'm on my way back. He's just feeling it out to see if Esau still had kill thoughts or has he let this thing go. And so he was feeling it out. The messengers came back. This is the response of the messengers now. The messengers came back and they said, we went to your brother Esau. And they said, now he is coming to meet you. Oh, my brother is coming to meet me. But they said, and 400 men are with him. Now, I don't know how you would be feeling, but I know how I would be feeling if I just robbed my brother of his birthright and his commitment was to kill me. And I said, bro, I'm coming home looking forward to seeing you. And he said, yeah, I'm coming to see you. But I got 400. I'm rolling 400 deep. That means he had 400 men with him. In great in great fear and distress. Are you feeling me right now? I'm talking about having faith in God and maintaining our faith in God. Just because you may be in great fear and distress, it doesn't mean that you cannot have faith in God. Sometimes we think two things are mutually exclusive. Faith in God and pain. Faith in God and brokenness. Faith in God and confusion. But I want someone to know uh, that faith in God trumps everything because God trumps everything. And so in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and camels as well. He thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So he's planning for the worst. Situation's bad. But the power in this next verse, the power in this next verse the Bible says, then Jacob prayed. Then Jacob, he prayed. He started talking to the Lord. When Jacob understood what was going down, when Jacob understood the implications of what was on the horizon, when Jacob understood that his life was in jeopardy, his experience was in jeopardy, and not just him, but those around him who he loved. Sometimes we just don't understand the value that we have to the people around us that we love. I want somebody in this building uh, to understand uh, that it is only your prayers and your worship that is holding back uh, the forces of darkness uh, from some of your family members uh, that don't know Jesus. Uh, it is because uh, you're willing to pray. Uh, it is because uh, you're willing to worship. It is because uh, you're willing to stand on faith uh, that the Spirit of the Lord comes in uh, like a flood uh, when your family doesn't even understand uh, what's happening. 
your family needs you to never give up on your faith in God. And so he prayed and sent them off. Sometimes you pray and nothing happens. And that's exactly what happens. But don't give up on your faith in God. There are people in this building right now, you're wondering, God, when are you even, forget to answer my prayer, when are you going to make me feel your presence? Online, I hear the voice of God. Some of you are asking, God, when? God, when? It's been a long time. I'm struggling. God, when? Some of you are saying that in your spirits. God, when? God, when? The Bible says, we read it. It's our main text. He said, so Jacob was left alone. No doubt it was dark by this time. Jacob was left alone because the Bible says he wrestled with this man until the breaking of the day. We have to recognize that sometimes it's in that aloneness. It's in that isolation. Now hear me. You could be in a crowd of people and be alone. It's isolation and being in tune with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. It is in that alone time that the Bible says that a man showed up. I hear my Bible tell me. God will never leave me or forsake me. I curse that lie. Anyone who is feeling like God has abandoned you, I curse that lie in the name of Jesus. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Never give up on your faith in God. And so the Bible says that he was left and he started wrestling with the presence of God. And the Bible says when the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. I'm coming to a close. I'm coming to a close. I'm going to make this last point and I'm coming to a close. He was wrestling with God by himself. Remember the state that he's in. He is in fear and he is in distress. But he prayed and he's wrestling with God. I know we sometimes preach it another way. You know, he was wrestling with God and, he, and God touched him. And, and we... we we think of it like a move of the Holy Ghost. God touched him. But the touch, the actual touch, wounded him. The actual touch broke him in a way that he would never be the same again. Now hear me online, hear me in the building. There are those of us that are wrestling with God. And it sounds like a negative thing, but the reality is, is that we should be wrestling with God. It's in that wrestle that our faith grows. It's in that process that we get closer to God. Because if we're honest with ourselves, uh, you don't have to be honest with yourself, but I'll be honest with myself as an example to you. There are things that I experience that just don't make any sense to me. It confuses me. It angers me. It depresses me. 
and I've got to wrestle with that. Don't give up on your faith in God. And while he's struggling, trying to understand, God, why is it that I work so hard, but I never get ahead of my job? It seems like the boss's buddies are always getting promoted. God, why is it that I'm trying to live a pure and holy life, but it seems like people who are living immorally, they're blessed. They have the favor. It doesn't make any sense. God, I'm trying to forgive and I'm trying to express grace and love on people, but they only take advantage of me. I give so much and no one stops to say thank you. I'm exhausted, God. I can't give anymore. I'm broken, God, I can't give anymore. And some of us, in the middle of wrestling with God, we have one of these experiences that breaks us. We have one of these experiences that touches us, and we will never be the same. This, this short, really quick, 50 years that I've been on this earth, I've seen some things. I've experienced some things while trying to wrestle with God. That brokenness of being touched. God, I want children. But I'm having miscarriages. Hope of life dashed. An emotional wreck. But I'm wrestling. We're wrestling. And after miscarriages, the baby comes. And six months later, my wife is diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm wrestling with God, but I'm being broken at the same time. I don't have to ask for a witness. I know there are witnesses. And truth is, there's some brokenness I'm not even ready to talk about. And so the Lord said, let me go. Someone's feeling broken while you're wrestling with God and, 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 and you're hearing a voice maybe say it's over. Don't go anymore. But Jacob said, I will. I will not let you go until you bless me. The truth of it is, it is in that brokenness that, that my life is being transformed. Somebody hear me, please. A Jacob is about to be transitioned into an Israel. Somebody who has overcome. Somebody who has prevailed. Somebody that has power with God. And as much as I hate the breaking, as much as I despise the hurt, it is in that process of experiencing this breaking it is in that experience of, ex of, of going through these things and never letting go that we receive the transformation. 
And so the Lord looks and says, okay, I see, I see, I see, I see your faith. I see your perseverance. I see your willingness to hold on to me regardless uh, of what's going on in your life, uh, regardless uh, of how uh, you're feeling right now, regardless of the fact that you're hurt right now. And he says, okay, what's your name? Jacob, low down dirty sinner. That's my name. And truth is, that's all of our names. Oh, but I got one for you. Israel, as a prince, you'll have power with God. But truth is, when you read the book of Revelation and you see the name that is written on the saints of God, I can guarantee you one thing, it will not be Israel, but it will be the name that is above every name. What are you trying to say, Brother Chris? There's a new name that we are going to be known by. It is the name of Jesus. I'm just going to say this one point, and I'm going to get out your way. The Lord said to him, because you have prevailed. I want you to look into the scripture closely. I encourage you to go home and read it. And you tell me where you see he prevailed. I see a broken man that walked with a limp from that time forward. So then what did the Lord mean when he say you prevail? Because he clearly, if we're talking about a physical fight, he lost that one. But we're not talking about a physical fight. We're not talking about a physical dynamic. He prevailed because he never gave up on his faith in God. Let's stand. I know. That there are people in the process of the type of transformation that the scripture is talking about. That the Lord is talking about here today. You're wrestling. And you've been knocked down a couple of times. You're wrestling. And you've been broken a couple of times. And you're still struggling. But God is saying, don't give up. Your change is coming. I'm not preaching miracle signs and wonders the way we preach them now. I believe in those and they're real. I'm preaching the type of transformation that the Bible talks about an old person becoming a new creation in Christ. Uh, I'm talking about a type of transformation uh, that your faith grows uh, to a level that you're allowing and you're willing to allow God uh, to use you, uh, to allow his light to shine uh, in your community. I'm talking about a change uh, that brings people from death uh, into life. Uh, I'm talking about a change that says, God, uh, even though I lost my job, God, uh, even though my wife is diagnosed with cancer, even though somebody in my family is broken, I'm still willing to hold on to my faith in you. I'm still willing to worship. I'm still willing to pray. I'm still willing to wrestle with you. I'm sorry. I've been way longer than I should have been, but I'm giving a call right now. This altar is open. The call is to those who are wrestling and you feel hurt and you're still wrestling. 
or you may be confused about an experience, but you're still trying to hold on to God. God has a calling on your life and you don't understand it. You don't understand why people are asking you to be involved. You don't understand why people are asking you to take on leadership roles and various involvements because you feel like no one was checking for you. You feel alone, like in your time of need, no one was there for you. But God was there. You may not have recognized it. God was there. And so this altar is open. I'm inviting. We're getting ready to come to a close and I'm about to sign off on our online broadcast. But this altar is open. I'm giving a call as well to anyone who God has been talking to you. You've been responding to faith. You're online, you're in this building, and God has been saying to you, I want you to take a next step in our relationship. I want you to take a next step in having faith in me. I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to be baptized in my name, and I will fill you with my Holy Spirit. And so in this wrestling, you've been wrestling with life, and you've concluded that life as presently constructed in your experience is unfulfilling. The reason for that is because God is calling you into a deeper relationship with Him. And so if you're in that category and you know God has been talking to you, you've just been saying, I'm not ready. I have sin in my life. There's some things I know I got to get rid of. You can't get rid of them. God is calling you. Stop saying I'm going to do it next week. Stop saying I'm going to do it next month. Stop saying I'm going to do it shortly. I'm going to get my life together. Then I'm going to give my life to God. That's not what God is asking. God is asking you to take that little bit of mustard seed faith, that faith that's just this small that I talked about, and put your faith in Him to say, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I'm going to come. I just want to give one last call to someone who said, you know, I'm just going to I'm just going to cruise. I'm good. I've tried to serve. I've tried to love. I'm not going to give up on my faith, but I'm just not going to go all in like I used to. It's just not worth it to me. I just don't have the time. God is calling for you. This one man, Jacob, whose name was change to Israel was part of the foundation of an entire nation that God would use to bless the entire world. What will God do with your life if you say, I will never give up on my faith in God? For those of you who are online, we are so glad you were able to join us this morning. We hope we know that you had a real encounter with Jesus. Just don't let it go by the wayside. We know that you have been blessed by the word and by the worship. And we pray that you will respond to this word in the way that God is talking to your heart. We look forward to seeing you next week, but we look forward to seeing the blessing and the favor of God that he is going to bestow on your life and those around you because you are willing to never give up on your faith in God. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you until we meet again.